Jesus in human form. Jesus in human form. Um, so there you hear the emphasis on the incarnation, right? The God becoming flesh. And as I said, that's what Christmas is all about. That's what we, you know, we don't technically, I have to tell my kids this, we don't technically celebrate Jesus' birthday because we don't know when he was actually born, but we're celebrating the incarnation. We're going a little deeper than that theologically. Um, and that's what the Belgic Confession is is talking to us about tonight and pointing us to the deity of Jesus Christ who comes down and takes on human flesh and becomes a human. Why does that matter? What does that mean? What are we saying? Well, that's what tonight is all about. That's what Hebrews is about. That's what the Belgic Confession is all about. I want you to notice in Hebrews chapter 1, notice how the writer, and again, we don't know who it was, but the writer divides history into two time periods. Now, we often speak of A.D. and B.C., right before Christ, and Anno Domine, the year of our Lord. The writer of Hebrews does something different. He divides time into the way God revealed himself before, in times long ago, and how he's spoken to us in these last days. Now, just a quick word when we read that phrase, last days, we sometimes think, well, the New Testament writers figured that Jesus was going to come back, maybe, if not tomorrow, maybe the next day. And so they were all expecting it right away. But really, whenever you read that phrase in the New Testament, the writers were just getting at the idea that the, the coming of Jesus began a new period in redemptive history that is called the last days. And they weren't really talking so much about Jesus could come back at any moment. They're saying this is the final chapter in redemptive history with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And the writer of Hebrews draws our attention to that and says, once upon a time, God spoke through uh, various times and various places through the prophets. And if you go through the Old Testament, you see how God disclosed himself and how he revealed himself to his people, right? Dreams and visions. Um, the priests had something called Urum and Thummim in their garments. That was, we don't know exactly, but it was per, uh, perhaps some form of incense that they used to discern God's will and that was how God spoke to his people and he spoke through the prophets and he brought his messages to the people in that way but all of those ways were limited no one dream could capture the fullness of God's nature and his revelation no Urim and no Thummim could capture the fullness of who God was and so all those ways in which God had revealed himself before, they were important, they were a part of God's plan and his work of revealing himself, but they were limited in what they could reveal. Now the writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus has come as God's final revelation, his final word to us. Now, if you um, listen to how other religions understand the person of Jesus, it's actually a good thing to do to try to understand. Um, and so this, not this past week, the week before, I went on to, uh, for example, a Mormon website. It's, I don't know, mormon.org or something like that. And you could actually start a chat with a Mormon person who's kind of standing by ready to answer your questions. And so I wasn't trying to be sneaky about this, but I, I also didn't want to say I'm a pastor and I'm trying to find out why I disagree with Mormonism. I didn't, I didn't think that would be right either. So I just said, I have some questions about how do you understand Jesus and so we talked for about an hour. Um, these chats don't go super quick, right? So you type a little, and I'm doing other things as I'm doing that. But anyways, I talked for an hour, and they said, well, you know, Jesus, we think he, he is eternal. He's been a spiritual being, and then he took on, took on flesh. And some of it sounded actually fairly similar to what we would, we would profess, but there were some big differences. And one of them, of course, is how the Mormons see Joseph Smith. They believe Joseph Smith is a prophet, and they believe that he comes bringing an extra revelation from God. The Book of Mormon is, they will tell you, another testament to the person of Jesus Christ. Now, the writer of Hebrews would actually take issue with that, because the writer of Hebrews says that God has spoken to us through his son, and his son is the final revelation. In other words, there's nothing more to say that has already been said. And so, again, Mormonism would, uh, would be out of sync here. That would be contradicting what the Bible um, teaches. In these last days, he's spoken to us by his Son. Now, it's true that we have much to say about the Bible, 
But there's nothing new to be revealed other than what God has said in Scripture and what he finally reveals to us in, his, uh, in the person of Jesus. Um, that also means that when we read through the Old Testament, when we look at what the prophets are saying, we begin to see that all of their messages point us to the person of Jesus. And Jesus is the fulfillment and the complete uh, and, and full revelation of who God is. Um, Jesus, in that sense, is, is, is God's climactic revelation to us. All the previous messengers, all the previous prophets point us to him. And in Jesus, we see the full picture of God's revelation. And the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is the greater revelation of God. Now, why is Jesus greater? Well, a couple of things. First, um, Jesus, well, I'll just give him straight up. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, and he's the imprint of God's nature. Um, verse 3, the writer says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. Now, here's what that means. When you go through the Old Testament, everywhere that God's presence shows up, it's something that is so absolutely terrifying that the people were afraid to look at it. They were afraid to get too close because they knew that if they did, it would destroy them. So on Mount Sinai, for example, when God is coming down, you remember there's thunder and there's lightning and flashes of light and uh, a cloud that's descending on that. And the radiance there is so much that the people beg Moses, don't make us get any closer because we know that it will destroy us. And when the people build the tabernacle and when they build the temple, there's this cloud that comes over the tabernacle or over the temple and the fullness of God's presence once again enters in and the people fall to the ground before it. Right? God's presence is so awesome and so holy that it strikes fear into the hearts of the people. Now, when the writer of Hebrews picks that idea up, he's saying that the fullness of God's glory comes to us in a way that is mediated to us. In other words, Jesus is the presence of God, but in Jesus, God comes to us in a way that we can, that we can handle. It's not going to destroy us. God's glory is mediated to us through Jesus. But Jesus still is, is, the, uh, is the presence of God. Uh, he still is the radiance of God's glory, but it comes to us in a way that we know it's not going to destroy us, but he still is the presence and the, and the glory of God. Now, writer goes on, says something else. He's also the exact representation of his being. Now, exact representation of God's being. Now, this is another key question, because today if you ask people, who is Jesus? What will they tell you? Well, again, um, I went to a Jehovah's Witness website as well. Now, they don't have a chat feature, so I had to just dig through some of their articles and find out um, what do Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And they will tell you, and I'll give you the quote, the Bible does not portray Jesus as being almighty God or equal to God. Let me say that one more time just so you get it. The Bible does not portray Jesus as being almighty God or equal to God. So Jehovah's Witness will tell you that Jesus was a real person, a good teacher. He was sent by God. You dig a little deeper and you can kind of begin to understand that they'll tell you he was created and a whole lot of other stuff. But they do not believe that Jesus is equal to God. Islam. I went to an Islamic website. Uh, they don't have an, any one official website that I could find, but they have a number of ones that look like they were pretty reputable. And the Islamic websites, they, Islam Muslims believe in Jesus. In fact, they hold Jesus in pretty high esteem. But they too will tell you, here's the quote from the Islamic website, Jesus is one of the greatest persons to have ever walked the earth. But he was not divine. He was not God in the flesh. In fact, a, a Muslim would tell you that is sacrilegious. So they believe in Jesus, they admire him, but he was a great teacher, not divine. Now, what about secularism today? What about if you talk to the average Joe or Jane on the street? Well, they will probably tell you that if they believe in Jesus, and I think many of them do, he was a good man. He was a wise teacher, he was a spiritual guru or something of that sort. But this 
nonsense about God in the flesh, we don't buy into that. Right? Jesus was a good man, wise teacher, spiritual guru, came to teach us an example, uh, or came to teach us good things and be an example, but he was not God. But Jesus claims more for himself. Um, Jesus was human, to be sure. We don't want to deny that. Some um, religions and some traditions deny that he was human. They just say he was kind of some spiritual being that only appeared human. But no, he was human. He was hungry. He was tired. He was thirsty. He ate fish for breakfast on the beach. He, you know, he dealt with human tem- uh, temptations that are common to all of us. He was human, fully human. But he was much more. And you listen to how Jesus refers to himself. John's Gospel, I think, does a is is perhaps one of the of the four, perhaps arguably, but he John really goes out of his way to show us the divine nature of Jesus. Right, the prologue to the Gospel: In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's no arguing it in John's mind. When Jesus refers to himself, what does he say so many times? I am the Good Shepherd. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the bread of life. I am living water. And if you, of course, know your Old Testament, you know what was God's name in the Old Testament? I am. So Jesus is taking that on himself. He's saying, I am God. I'm using the divine name for myself. Oh, here's maybe just a little side note. If Jesus was really saying all these things, he was clearly believing himself to be God. Now, if Jesus were, uh, if that were not true, then you'd have to look at Jesus and say, you know, he needs some mental help. He's not right in his mind, right? That's C.S. Lewis's famous little um, riddle. He said Jesus was either, he was a liar, maliciously deceiving people, or he was a lunatic because he didn't know himself from a divine being, or he really is Lord, right? Jesus, in other words, is making these claims and uh, you can't have this, C.S. Lewis says, you can't have this nonsense about Jesus just being a good teacher because if you look at what he's saying, he's claiming to be God. He's claiming div- uh, the divine nature for himself. Uh, you look through the Article 10, Article 10 that we read in the Belgian Confession. One in essence with the Father, co-eternal, uh, the Son of God, eternally begotten, not made, not created, because then he'd be a creature. Clearly, Jesus is man but he is more than man. He is also God. Um, And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying when he says the exact representation of God's being. The word there, representation, was a word that you'd use if you were um, a goldsmith and you made money. I mean, you you actually made money. You made it to... You know, give away or however they did that back then. I don't know what the mint was, but you have um, gold and it's in liquid form and then you put a stamp in it and that puts an imprint into it and then that imprint then is the exact representation. That's the word the writer is using here. He's saying that Jesus is God in the flesh. Um, You and I, by God's grace, can become godly people. We can reflect his nature. We reflect his character. Not perfectly, but we, as we grow in Christ, that's what happens. But we will never be God. We will be godly, but we will never become God. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, isn't just godly. He is God. Now, that means, think about that for a minute. Do you want to know what God is like? Do you want to know what the God who created the universe is like? Do you want to know what the God who who is over all things, who is eternal, do you want to know what he's like? You just have to look at Jesus. You just have to see the, the Jesus who loves people who are hurting and lonely and broken and marginalized, whose heart goes out to the people who other everyone else ignores and casts off to the side. You want to know what God is like? You see him as he speaks against sin but embraces the sinner as he takes little children on his knee. That is what God is like. That is the character of the God of the universe. You just have to look at Jesus. You just have to see who he is. Now, what good is all of this? Practically speaking, well, Hebrews gives us um, at least two things. I think there are other places, by the way, in the New Testament that flesh out more of 
the advantage that it is that Jesus is both God and man. But we're going to look at just what the writer of Hebrews says here in these few verses. First of all, um, he upholds the universe. Right? Jesus upholds the universe. You read that there in um, uh, the first part of um, the second part of verse three. He is sustaining all things by his powerful word. Sustaining all things. Um, I've already said, other religions teach that Jesus was a created being. He came into existence when God began to create. Um, the writer of Hebrews would again disagree with that. And Debbie, I'm glad you opened with Colossians 1, because Colossians 1 is another glorious passage on the nature of Jesus, who was there at creation, not only as a witness, but he is the one by whom, for whom, and through whom all things came into being. Jesus is the agent of creation. He is a participant in creation. And someone who's created can't really participate actively in his or her own creation. Right? Jesus is the one by whom, for whom, and through whom all things were created. And not only that, but he is upholding the universe. He is upholding this great and glorious creation. Now, we say that a lot, and we maybe fail to appreciate it. You all saw the moon coming in. If you didn't, you'll see it on the way out. It's huge. You can't miss it. Um, and it reminds you, it reminds us of how small we were. But here's another one. I, I, I always like to try to think of, well, I don't think of them. I go on the Internet and Google them. Then I find out these little analogies that help us appreciate how big the universe is. Um, I should have brought a marble with me tonight. I've kind of forgot, but picture in my hand a grain of sand. I can tell you there's a grain of sand there, but you may or may not believe me. Don't believe me. There's no sand there. But, but pretend. A grain of sand and a marble. And we put them about an inch apart. What is that? About that far. And now the marble would be, that's about to scale of the sun and the earth. The, the grain of sand might be a little bigger, but not much. Um, now the next question is, okay, where would the next nearest star be? Right, where would the next nearest star be? Um, you'd have to go from our little grain of sand here all the way to, I always get turned around in here, but to the other side of I-5 and Kubler. That's where the next nearest star would be if we're looking at a scale like this. Now then the question is, so how big is the universe? I don't think anyone really knows for certain. But they say if we're going to use this scale, you'd have to travel 100,000 miles on that scale. And Jesus holds it all together. He upholds it by his hand. And not only does Jesus hold it all together, but the writer of Hebrews says he makes purification for our sin. He's not a God who's above this universe, who's above this cosmic world, not engaged with it, not participating. He's a God who holds the universe together and sees the problem of sin present in the world and becomes part of it, takes on human flesh and enters into it. And because he's a man, because he's human, because he's fully human, he's qualified to stand in for us. Right? In other words, the, the Heidelberg Catechism, I think, says that really well, and the Belgic Confession comes back to it a little later. The Heidelberg Catechism says that man has sinned, man must pay for his sin. Right? In other words, God can't look at the world and say, well, you human beings sure made a mess of it. I've got to do something. I guess I'll punish an owl. Right? He couldn't do that because human beings are the ones who are guilty, and so human being must be punished. But no human being can stand up under God's righteous judgment. No human being can bear that penalty and, and live. And so Jesus comes. He not only lives the life that we couldn't live, by his divine power, but he also dies the death that we deserve and is resurrected again. And it's only because Jesus is both human and both divine that he's able to do that. And then one final thing, he purifies us, and the writer of Hebrews says, and he will come back to that again later in the letter, he says, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Um, in my little conversation with the Mormon website, I, I started asking, so what do you have to do to be saved? How do you, how do you find salvation? And, and I have to say, the person on the other end was very friendly and uh, I think very sincere. Um, and she says, well, Jesus has made atonement for our sins. He's paid the penalty. 
but you must now be baptized and you must, um, there was one other thing, I forget what it was, and then you must also continue to live a life of obedience. And I, I answered back, I said, well, how do you know when it's enough? It always feels like you have to keep doing stuff. And what if you fail? And what if you mess up? Then do you lose your salvation? Well, no, you just have to keep trying a little harder. And But you see, the writer of Hebrews comes back, and what does he say? He says, Jesus, he did what? He sat down because the work was done. Because the payment had been made, the penalty had been taken away, the purification was complete. And so we have a Savior who in his divine nature and in human nature comes together, removes the penalty of sin once and for all. So there's no ongoing work that needs to be done to keep us scrubbed clean in case we mess up again. And then finally, that idea of Jesus sustaining the world, and we'll, we'll close with this. Um, the word is in, it's in verse 3, and I saw this. It's translated in another translation as um, bearing. And I think, you know, sometimes Jesus bearing the universe, it sounds like Atlas. You remember your Greek mythology where Atlas has the weight of the world on his shoulders and he's bearing it up and he's holding it and it's kind of crushing him down there. You might think, well, is that what it's like that Jesus is bearing the universe? Well, no, actually, there's another way to look at that. There's the, in a few months, we start the torch relay, right? The Olympic torch. And it's carried along from one place to the next and the torch bearers are bearing that torch along to the goal, to the finish line. You see, and that's what Jesus is doing for us as well. He's carrying this universe along to its goal, to that goal of perfection, to that day when Jesus will return as judge to make everything new again and to deal once and for all with the problem of sin and evil in this world. And then at that point, then his work will be finally and fully complete. He's carrying, he's bearing the world along like a torchbearer, bringing it to its goal, that goal of perfection, that goal of uh, yeah, wholeness that God intended, but that was marred by sin. That's Jesus, God in the flesh, come to us. That's Jesus in the work that he came to do. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for... Uh, sending to us Jesus. We thank you for the work that he has done, for the way that he bears our flesh, for the way that he knows what we experience. He knows what it's like to be human. There's no temptation that we've experienced that he knows nothing about. But Lord, you also gave us a Savior who is perfect in every way. And in Jesus, we seek you. And so help us uh, to see more of you, help us to desire to know you better and to trust in you more fully for the work that you've done. Thank you that you bear this universe, you hold it all together, that as grand and glorious as this creation is, Lord, it's all in your hands and you are sustaining it and you are carrying it along to that goal when it will be made perfect and whole and new again. In Christ we pray, amen. Well, let's, uh, let's sing Silent Night, 344, um, and we will uh, sing...